So good morning. I want to welcome all the members of the media who are here this morning. Uh, it's been uh, an eventful weekend, I'm sure, for all of you, um, as we learned of a, uh, a second uh, accuser of sexual harassment against the governor. Um, and I want to just take everyone back. I think this is important as to how we actually how we've gotten here. Um, you know, you go back a month ago, the attorney general released a preliminary report from her investigation, basically saying not basically saying one of the findings was that the governor and his administration intentionally underreported deaths in nursing homes. So essentially was dishonest, willfully. They had the data. They knew what the deaths were. They didn't report it to the people of New York and to the public and to the state legislature. And that the governor's order played a role in that, which would lead most people to believe that's why they didn't report it. Two weeks later, we have the secret meeting and the leaked audio recording uh, of the secretary to the governor, Melissa DeRosa, um, apologizing to lawmakers for the political inconvenience and acknowledging that the reason they didn't come forth with the data was because they were concerned about a federal investigation, which sounded to some people, I'm not a lawyer, maybe like even obstruction of justice, but they were willfully trying to uh, not put forward that information because of a potential Department of Justice investigation. At that time, our conference stridently called for a, for a federal investigation, as we had for many, many months before that, because we knew we could not get an independent investigation from any other source, or one was, did not seem to be forthcoming from our colleagues across the aisle. Today, I'm proud to say there is a, f a federal investigation. The Department of Justice has heeded those calls, um, and that is ongoing. Since then, actually since we adjourned last week, there have been two credible allegations of sexual harassment against the governor. And I want to say that the two women that have come forward have shown more courage in doing so than many of my colleagues across the aisle and many people who have been elected to serve uh, their constituents here in Albany. And I'm not saying that just for hyperbolic pur purposes. That's the truth. We have colleagues across the aisle who even today cannot simply rescind the governor's emergency powers. This governor currently is, has been managing the state through the most significant public health crisis during a global pandemic with unchecked power, and through that all, they have not been able to rescind those powers or be able to bring themselves to rescind those powers. And in spite of writing a letter saying they would, in spite of saying they're thinking about it, today they'll get the 18th opportunity to do just that. It's not hard, they just simply need to vote yes. But the resolution will be put on the floor for the 18th time today. But more importantly, I think when you look at the totality, you have a governor now who has now two investigations from two separate agencies on two distinct and very troubling issues. One potentially criminal uh, investigation from the Department of Justice into covering up nursing home deaths and to why that was done and how that was done. And then you have an investigation now from the Attorney General uh, into these sexual harassment allegations. You have a, 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 an environment which we have known about. Let's just be honest. People in Albany, politicos here in New York State, have known about the threats and the bullying and the hostile work environment of this administration and this governor for a long time. It just wasn't ever widely reported. It was whispered about, it was talked about at you know, local bars and restaurants and sort of in, in the salons here in Albany and maybe in New York City, but never reported. And that's, again, because we've had people, these two women included, who've been brave enough to come forward and actually talk about it. And as less and less people become afraid of this governor, I think you could hear more and more stories uh, the Ron, Assemblyman Ron Kim, you know, came forward with his story, and I know there's been members in the press that have also received calls like that. And so it is for all those reasons that you have a governor facing two federal, two investigations on two separate issues, 
which is going to monopolize a lot of resources and time, that I sit there and say, how can that person also do the job they've been elected to do in guiding us through this pandemic, in guiding us through the fiscal and economic crisis that we are facing? How can the needs of New Yorkers come before the needs of this administration as they deal with cooperating with these two investigations? And that was why I called for the governor to resign and step aside. Now, this is not a political decision for me. I thought about this long and hard. In fact, the person that would take the governor's spot is Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul, also a Democrat. So it's not as though a Republican is going to fill the governor's spot if he did, in fact, resign. This is about what is the right thing for New Yorkers. The right thing is for the state Senate Democrats and Assembly Democrats to rescind his powers today, last week. The right thing is for these investigations to go forward, to get to the truth. And I believe the right thing is for the governor to step aside. And so uh, I talked about this with my conference yesterday, made them aware of where I was and my position. Um, I know other, some other members have called for similar uh, things. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm, op I'm hopeful. I want to thank uh, the Attorney General who rejected the governor's initial overture to, I guess, have his own appointee investigate these allegations. Uh, then there was, you know, it, this is sort of morphed. The governor wasn't there. He didn't get there. I think it was the pressure and the courage and the political will of, of folks that got us to this independent investigation. But um, the Attorney General, again, I'm, I'm grateful that she held her ground and will be doing an independent investigation. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see where that leads. Uh, and with that, I will certainly take any questions. Senator, is Governor Cuomo entitled to the presumption of innocence? Yes, yes. I believe that there is a due process. He is due that as anybody is. The, the, my call for him to step aside isn't a condemnation or saying he is guilty or not guilty. I also think the women are due to the due, right? But they're both due an investigation to get to the bottom of it because there will be people who will say that they are, you know, maybe taking opportunity uh, and, and, and there will be people that say the governor is guilty. They're both due a due process. and That's why we have that. My concern was more that could he effectively focus on the pandemic response, on the fiscal crisis, the economic crisis, while at the same time focusing and engulfed on two separate um, significant investigations on two separate issues. I don't know that any one person could realistically dedicate the proper time to New Yorkers while also dealing with that. Two women have accused the governor of sexual harassment and you're calling for his resignation. 26 women have accused Donald Trump of sexual assault. Um, have you called, did you call for the president's resignation? And if not, uh, you open yourself up to a, a charge of hypocrisy. So I, I, I certainly get the, the charge that some people make. I, I've always said when it comes to those kinds of questions regarding the, the president, the former president, or the current president, I'm a state senator. This is the governor of New York, the CEO of New York State. I have an absolute obligation as the leader of our conference as well uh, as we deal with the executive here. Um, I wasn't neck deep involved. If I was a member of Congress or a member of the U.S. Senate, I think that would be a, a much fair or maybe appropriate question as far as the, the execution of my duties. Um, if this was the governor of North Carolina or California, you probably wouldn't maybe hear me opining or calling for this the way I am today. So I think it's much more relevant that this is the governor of New York. I am a New York State Senator, the Senate Minority Leader. And also this is the governor of New York during a pandemic where he has extraordinary powers. Uh, this is one of the most powerful public uh, our political officials in the country. And that's before those extraordinary powers. Constitutionally, the governor of New York is one of the most powerful elected officials, almost by definition, in the country. Now he has been managing the state almost by himself for the last year. And I think, again, for all those reasons, this is much more, um, a much bigger issue, these allegations at this current moment. A million years ago. You know, you were 
highlighting your support for the president. Where were you back then discussing these very serious allegations of sexual assault against the president? Sure. And why should you have credibility now? So I don't think I ever defended the president uh, on, on that kind of issues. When, when I was talking about, when I was running for Congress, uh, I then and now highlighted my support of the president's agenda, the president's uh, policies, the policies that were coming out of the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House. Uh, I don't think I ever said, and I support uh, the president's comments about women or, or the things that were uh, uh, alleged to occur. Again, I don't think anything, there was never any investigation that I was aware of that led to any um, uh, uh, proof. There was obviously serious allegations made against him. Those should have been taken seriously. I think they were taken seriously by a lot of people. Um, but my, my comments, or when I was running for Congress, it was focused, and I think you can look back, was always focused on the issues, whether that was issues of border security, trade, support for the military, uh, and I would stand by those issues today. I certainly wouldn't defend uh, any of the behaviors or allegations uh, that were made against him. But to be sure, uh, even when you were running for Congress, when it was very relevant to your prospective job, you still did not speak out against uh, about the president, even though I believe you just said that you had spoken to the allegations of the previous president, the current one. Um, I'm just trying to understand, did you not feel it was relevant while you were running for Congress? Whenever I was asked about issues with the president, I defended the president's policies, not always the president's behavior. And I think that was consistent when I was running for Congress, and I would say that today. But again, and, and, and I'm going I'm to address something. I have no doubt that folks from the second floor would say, let's talk about Donald Trump, because that's the only thing that they want to talk about. And I would say today, that's definitely the only thing they want to talk about. And, and I get that, and we all get that. But the, the point is, that, that actually misses the point. For the last four years, they had a deflection point to talk about the president on almost any issue, whether it was relevant or whether it wasn't relevant. They don't have that any longer. President Biden is the president. Donald Trump is the former president. And within a few months of President Trump being out of office, suddenly the governor is engulfed in scandal because I would believe suddenly people are taking a closer and more scrutinized look at this governor's both handling of the pandemic and this governor's personal conduct and behavior. He made himself a national sensation. He made himself a national star. He wrote the book about leadership in the middle of the pandemic. No one else did those things. And no one else's bad behavior or comments take away from what these two women are alleging. No one else's behavior or conduct takes away or absolves him of not being honest about nursing home deaths and covering that up. And so he can, him and his folks can point to President Trump all day long and there was a ton of scrutiny, obviously, on the president over the last four years, and some of it was rightfully so. But this scrutiny, he owns himself, and no amount of finger pointing is going to get him out of these uh, investigations. Only the truth will, will have to come out, and only that can, uh, I think, be, be, you know, be what we're talking about today. Uh, I have not spoken to the majority leader, uh, you know, as of last weekend. Uh, I'm certainly expect we will speak uh, in the next uh, few days. Um, look, I think how could this not impact budget negotiations? You know, there, there's just no two ways about it. I don't think I'm, you know, shocking anybody with that revelation. Um, this is going to impact budget negotiations, which again goes back to the call for him to step aside. I, I think it's going to be very difficult for the governor and for the two houses to negotiate a budget, it was gonna be hard anyways, right? This is gonna be a tough budget year as it was, and now you have this added cloud, uh, to put it mildly, over these negotiations. And I think that makes it very difficult for the legislature, for the majorities, to negotiate with the governor um, because you don't know what's going on, you don't know the context, you don't know, you know his behavior, what is he saying, is he doing this because this is good from a legal strategy, is it good from a political, it just, and I think more importantly, it, for New Yorkers, they have to believe that everybody here, certainly the governor and the legislative leaders, when they're in that room, 
they have the primary focus needs to be the constituencies and the people that we represent. If it's anything else, you can't do the job effectively. And I just don't know how the governor could be in that room and not be primarily focused on these investigations. And as a point of historical context, I, several years ago, as a new member, also called for Senator Dean Skelos to step down as, my, as majority leader when he was also under investigation. And I did it for the same reason. I didn't think that his focus would be where it should be, that it would be on the investigations, which I think most people could appreciate and understand. So this is not just a, that was a Republican, and I made the same call for really the same reasons. What does this also say about the culture in Albany? I mean, we've had, we had sexual harassment laws passed in 2018 after years of, I mean, you have Vita Lopez, you have lawmakers, stories that go back years and years of abuse, et cetera. But so sure. what, what are we looking at forward? I mean, again, the governor's champions, the Me Too movement, other Democrats, Republicans, et cetera, but like Albany as a whole, is this a stain on Albany itself? And also where can state government move forward from here? Look, I think when, whenever something like this happens to a state official, it's always a stain on Albany, right? I mean, it's always a stain on New York. This gets national news and then people identify New York State with things that we would rather not be identified with. Um, and I think rightfully so. Uh, I think it's a reminder that this is, an on, this is a problem. That, that, these, that these kinds of things in the workplace remain a problem. It remains a problem that I think gets lip service, but I don't know that everyone always really understands what this looks like. And, and you know, everybody thinks, well, not me, right? It's always somebody else. It's easy to say them too. I think me too is really the operative term there, right? It, it's, it, it's, you know, obviously for the victims, that, that's where that came from, the idea that I've also been a victim of that. But I think sometimes people need to look in the mirror that, you know, have I ever been, have I ever made comments that could be construed that way? Have I ever done something like that? Uh, and I think that that's, we as a, as, a, as a culture here, just like any organization, need to take a hard look in the mirror. And when we're going through sexual harassment training, it, it just can't be one of those things you're checking the box, I got to do this, which, you know, we've all been a part of these things and sometimes that's what these things become, but it can't be. It's got to be something that you take very seriously because it can end, first of all, you could be victimizing somebody, even if it is unintentional, you could be victimizing somebody and causing them harm. You could force them to want to leave their job. You could make, you know, be, be con con uh, condoning a hostile workplace environment. Now, in this case, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the allegations seem pretty significant that you would be hard-pressed to not appreciate what you were saying. It, you know, these allegations are, are pretty significant. The one involved forcibly kissing someone. You know, I, I, I don't know if there's anybody in America that thinks that that's okay. Um, uh, and so I think it's a reminder that we have a lot of work to do as a, as a society. Um, I'll say as men. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, nobody would t teach your, your, your son or your daughter that this was okay in your own home. So that it shouldn't be okay at the workplace. Um, you know, I, I know that there'll be pushes to pass laws because that's what we do. But, you know, we pass a lot of laws and it's still there. I think this is a behavior thing. I don't know that you can legislate moral conduct all the time. Um, you can try. But at the end of the day, you need leaders who really buy into it. It just can't be a political talking point. It has to be deeper and bigger than that. So this is only tangentially related, but in light of these new allegations, what are your thoughts on the effort a couple of weeks ago by Nick Langworthy to create a recall function in state government? So, you know, look, at I, I think that uh, there's other states that, that have this. Wisconsin, I know, has it. Um, uh, California has it. Um, one of my colleagues, Senator Borello, was present, I believe, at that uh, conference. Uh, I have not discussed this with our conference, but I can tell you that the, the, the idea of giving power to the, the public, giving power to the people, I don't think inherently there's anything wrong with that idea of having that tool. Um, New York doesn't have it currently. Uh, we have other means, right? We have other constitutional means. Uh, but I think, uh, I think the broader public would always support the idea that they get to play a part in 
if you know if an official is um, is is deserved to be removed. I think the public is always going to support the idea that they should play a part in who should serve in office and not just people uh, in closed back rooms or in, in the state legislature. So uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I don't know if it's different in different states, but the idea or the general concept of recall I don't think is uh, one that we should uh, shy away from or should be opposed to. Well, again, I, I think uh, to uh, to Dan's uh, question, uh, I think it's going to have a, a significant impact, not only on the budget process, but probably on the rest of session, right? Because to your point, I don't think these things are going to be wrapped up um, quickly uh, if they're doing the investigation the way a lot of these investigations, because they can go on for a long time. Uh, and, and they can go also in different, they, they can spin off in different directions that uh, maybe at the start are not, in, are not uh, thought about, but they can go in other ways. Uh, depending on where on what people say and and where that goes, so it's going to have an impact on the budget. There's no question about it. It's going to have an impact on legislation. No question about it. Uh, and that's why that's again why Morgan, for me, I made the decision as Senator Rob Ort that the governor should step down because I just don't know how he he plays such a pivotal the, the governor plays such a pivotal role in the budget negotiations, as we all know and have witnessed over the years, I think it's hard for me to know or to believe that he's gonna be properly focused there and not, as you would expect, focused on the two separate but significant investigations uh, engulfing his office. Bill, question? Given how, given how much the governor has micromanaged everything with this pandemic, last question. Like Governor Hochul could step in and figure this out, right? Well, again, Bill, I would say those micromanaging powers would be, should be rescinded so that Lieutenant Governor Hochul would not come in necessarily at, you know, with those same broad powers that Governor Cuomo has. Uh, but look, at she's still the governor of New York. She still has constitutionally uh, 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 expansive powers. And um, uh, I'm sure that some of my policy disagreements with the governor I would share with Lieutenant Governor Hochul. She's from Western New York. I, I know her, so I, I already probably know where some of those policy disagreements would be. Um, but this is, I'm not calling this because, again, because I prefer Lieutenant Governor Hochul to Governor Cuomo. They're both Democrats. I'm sure many of her views or policies would mirror his. This is about, you have a toxic culture that has clearly been, been condoned and put forward from this executive and it's one that has existed for a long time. You have two investigations going on on very serious allegations um, against the governor and his office. You are in the middle of a public health pandemic. You're in the middle of a fiscal and economic crisis. How many things can one person really deal with and focus on? That's why whoever the lieutenant governor was, I think uh, would be better in a better position to come in be laser focused on the needs of New Yorkers and not the needs of their administration or their political agenda or, or defending themselves from two investigations. Senator, what is your understanding of the timeline on which the Attorney General is under to find and then deputize a special prosecutor? And are you comfortable that the Attorney General is committed to finding someone who is above reproach? So I, the first, I don't know the first question, and I apologize. Obviously, this is uh, newer to me as well. Um, I do think the attorney general is committed to getting to the, to the truth. In, in some weird way, we're here, or initially on the nursing home piece, because of the work that she did. Absent her preliminary investigation and report, we would never have had any sort of independent confirmation that, that there was underreporting of deaths. So uh, I credited her then, and I think she, you know, she is elected by the people of New York, not by the governor, not only by Democrats, she's elected by the people of New York. And so I have to believe in the, in the office and in the, in, the, in the idea that she will do the best job she can to get to the truth. Thank, Thank you, you guys everybody. very much.